Welcome to the new sound of online radio. Welcome to the sound of Universal Broadcasting Network. Because you make me feel like I've been locked out of heaven. A mix of today's hits and hard-to-find favorites. Combined with the most entertaining and intriguing talk anywhere. This is your sound. This is the sound of Universal Broadcasting Network at UBNRadio.com. What a sexy Friday it is here in Hollywood, California. Welcome, everybody, to the Tech Cat Show, where we talk about tech trends impacting your business. And we have, really, one of my favorite people in the world on the phone. And I know I say that almost every week when I do this, but I really mean it this time. Someone who allowed me to uh, videotape back in the days when there was tape, videotape his wedding. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce... The interactive TV guy, Mr. Jody McAfee, coming to us straight from a hotel room in San Francisco. There he is. Or so he tells us it's a hotel room in San Francisco. <laughs> How are you doing this so, morning, Jody? I actually think the title of that wedding video is was renamed uh, Watch Lori Schwartz Get Progressively Drunk Over an Evening. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true. Um, Jody had uh, invited me and my husband to his wedding, and we uh, we said we would, you know, uh, capture it on um, AV equipment of the time. Um, but also there was wine and there was champagne, and what's a girl to do? What's a <laughs> That's right. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> so Jody is an old friend, um, not old himself, but we've known each other for a long time since we were 12, I think. Um, and Jody is one feels, of those, feels that way. Feels that way. Um, Jody's been in the business for about 20 years, really, um, working in the television programming and advertising game, really fighting the fight for advanced TV solutions and advanced advertising solutions. And we met when I was at Interpublic, and he was selling interactive advertising for a variety of different networks. And so you've worn many hats in in the space. But tell us a little bit about what you're doing now, and you know, sort sort of how you see the TV space evolving? Um, it's a well, big question. What I'm doing now is I, um, I'm the GM for a group at Samsung called Samsung Ad Hub. Um, our remit is to bring, is to develop and bring to market um, advertising opportunities across our device and screen ecosystem. Um, obviously, we are a market leader in smartphones and connected TVs, and so we're, we're developing ways to um, allow marketers to utilize those screens for promotional purposes. Excellent. And that, that is um, something that you moved to New York to help set up, I know. And you were in London, and you were working at sort of a variety of different companies for a chunk of time in the interactive space, TV space, right? So it's, um, it's kind of, it's, it's a longish story. <laughs> have like the well, we have day. 45 minutes, uh, so. <laughs> so I think you're, so when I, when I moved to London, I was actually working with a connected TV startup called MiniWeb Technologies um, that happened to be based, or happened to be backed by a VC that was Denver based, and I was in Denver at the time. And so I moved to, um, to London to actually help them sell the company, and then we ended up raising another round. And as part of that raise, um, I was responsible for getting our deal done with Samsung um, and developed a relationship with Samsung. Who wanted? Who at the time knew that they wanted to figure out a way to utilize screens for advertising purposes? Um, so I I started that role in London, uh, but as as the platform evolved, and particularly given our market share and the number of connected devices we have in the United States, the bulk of the work that we were doing was happening here, and so I was asked to relocate to New York in April, which I did. So we spent. We spent four years in London. Uh, we loved it there. Um, we're now in Brooklyn. Our office is in Soho. Oh, um, Brooklyn is just like London. <laughs> so we lived in Wimbledon. So I say all the time, gosh, this area around the Barclays Center really, really reminds me of the All England Lawn Tennis Club. Right, right. And the p people talk the same. Um, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, and I've known you for a long time when you were at another company, Turner Media Group, and you're, you, you've always been an advocate and also a salesperson ultimately in selling interactive ad solutions in the broadcast 
environment and that world has changed a lot so what what do you see happening we all have connected TVs now do we have to have ads there is that going to be what's going to pay for this ecosystem moving forward um do we have to have ads there I mean you know, it, it's interesting because I think you have a lot of people who are going back and forth in terms of their consumption of video between online and then slowly adopting things like connected devices. And we run into this all the time around, you know, both internally and externally where, um, you know, people are like, well, gosh, I don't want ads in that. And it's somebody's got to pay for the content. Right, right, um, right, right. And, and it almost, I'm not sure if this is generational or, or, or what, but my sort of standard, my standard response to that is, look, you can't take what happened in terms of the democratization of the music industry and apply that to the video industry because it is a hell of a lot easier and cheaper to record a song yeah. and put it online and try to monetize it than to actually produce a compelling piece of whether that's a, you know, a half hour sitcom, an hour drama or, or something like um, House of Cards, it's expensive and somebody's got to pay for that. And, you know, you've, you've almost got this, this group of users that they basically say, OK, I want all my content free and I don't want any ads in it either. Yeah. And that's well, kind of unfair. <laughs> good luck. Good luck to you. And yeah, yeah. I hope you really enjoy day after day of cat videos on YouTube. Right, right, right. Because premium content is going to cost something. Because behaviorally, what I'm finding now is that I go to the device where I know the show or content I want is going to be. So I find myself on Netflix for a little bit on the Apple TV. But then I switch to the Samsung connected environment and I go to my Fox TV app because there's a show there I forgot to catch the day before, then I might bop into a different room and look at it on the TiVo. So I'm very driven by where is the thing I want to watch. And, and I don't really differentiate anymore between how I have to get it. And I don't mind paying for it or watching well, an ad as long as I get what I want when I want it. You know what I mean? And I think you're making a really good point about behavior. Um, and I think it's something that people in our industry tend to lose sight of in terms of what works on what screen. Um, but I think you're seeing pe people migrating back and forth. And, and I, one of the things I've said for years is I think that people's attention spans shrink as the screen gets smaller. Are you still talking? Um, <laughs> Just kidding. What's that? I said, are you still talking? Yeah, it's I'm good. still talking. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> that's, that's, some things really never change. Um, so the, the, it, and what I mean by that is I, I think that on smaller screens, you're seeing a lot of sort of snacking and then people finding things on those smaller screens. And then depending on what that piece of content is, they might go ahead and consume it on that smaller screen or they might decide I need to migrate to my, to the larger screen because I would prefer, I would prefer to watch this on a larger screen. So they're using, um, the, they're using the phone or the tablet for the discovery piece and then they're going to the bigger screen for the consumption. Well, I think I I think that's correct. I think the other thing that that they're using the smaller screen to do is to is to curate, and I think you're going to see, to me, curation is going to be a big thing in, in the consumption of video going forward. Oh, interesting, um, fun. So, and, and I and I think we're sitting in a pretty interesting place because obviously, given the fact that there's work around the the synchronization of smartphones and smart TVs we think that we can be a leader in, in that type of behavior. Right, because all, all those devices will talk to each other. And I do that now. Like, I actually do use a Samsung tablet and watch my Samsung connected TV. But then in another room, I do the same thing with Apple devices. But the truth is that those devices are beautiful. Like, the screens are gorgeous, you know, um, on those Samsung TVs. And, you know, it makes you so happy to be watching things like that. So my question for you is also because- Well, yeah, but, but, yeah. But, but a quick point on that. Yes, yeah. the, the, the screen resolution is incredible, but one of the things that I have discovered is there are some people I actually would rather not see- That big? <laughs> in, in that high, higher resolution. Yeah, I think that's uh, a lot of- Like, yeah. D Dick Vitale, for instance, in that resolution, <laughs> scares the crap out of me. I think that is uh, going to be an, an issue for many actors and actresses <laughs> as we move forward. 
Um, well, you right now, you, the way that you're sitting with the Skype, it's so funny because you're in like the lower left corner of the screen. So it almost looks like we're doing an art movie where we've chosen <laughs> to place Jody in the corner there. It actually looks kind of cool. Um, <laughs> this is Jody in the morning, <laughs> you know, talking to TV. Anyway, you also had time um, working intimately with the Dish Network and with Microsoft and, you know, Direct and all the major sort of cable satellite operators, are they jumping on to this fast enough or are they, you know, only going to own that broadband connection? I mean, so many, so much chatter now with that net neutrality point, but what, what do you think is going to happen? Are they going to catch up? Are they going to own this marketplace too? Or is it going to be owned by the Samsungs, the LGs, the Apples? Oh, this is one of those questions where I have to say, any thoughts expressed in the next five minutes are my own and not right, right. the <laughs> not the thoughts or opinions of anyone at Samsung. No, to Electronics. totally. And, and uh, yeah, and I didn't want to bring up, I'm not asking you a Samsung question. I'm really asking you, because you've worked with all of them. Do you think, you know, you've worked, all right, let's talk about Dish and Direct and, and Microsoft specifically. Like, you've worked with them. Do you think they're moving fast enough? Um, I, I think they're, ma I think they're making progress and I think, I think they're taking making steps in the right direction. Um, you know, I think the Dish's OTT offer is going to be really interesting. Um, and OTT is over the top, um, right? Over the top, so receiving video outside of your, you know, cable or satellite package. Wait, so... Or how do you explain it? You explain So wait, it. hold on, that begs the question. Who's your audience? Because you had to explain that. <laughs> We have a mixed audience, my friend. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> okay. That's the wor good, the good world. To know. The world is our audience. <laughs> Let's hear it from the crowd in the studio because they often throw underwear if there's an attractive guest in here. So, who, yeah, there they are. There. Yeah, is Jody? Jody? Uh, Jody's saying things. Yeah, they're very passionate about you. I'm seeing a lot of girls with big smiles on their face. Awesome. <laughs> no, I, we always explain everything because it is a really mixed audience. And that's the interesting thing, I think, about today's space, too, is you have content creators who all of a sudden find themselves having to become technologists. You have technologists finding themselves becoming distributors. Distributors now are becoming studio heads. So I always explain everything because people now – are in this space are merging and fusing together really so well and I, I hate to use a word that gets terribly overused in our industry but there's there is a lot of both disruption and disintermediation going on um, you know and and the value chain and who sits where in the value chain seems to change almost weekly yes very true. and and if you're not if you're not moving forward to your point about the likes of Dish and Direct, someone's going to take your place in the value chain. Right. Um, right. And and I'll, I'll be honest, I don't know who and how. I mean, one of the things. I mean, let's think back to years ago, right? When um, when Comcast did their deal with my, with Media Center, and you know, at the time, I was like, okay, so that's kind of interesting, right? Because if Comcast can figure out a way to use Media Center to deliver content and, and you're get out about, of it. Were you talking about Microsoft's play? Yeah, yeah, So yeah. X, X, what became Xbox. Okay, so Comcast which was, makes... Which was, what, 50 years ago? Yeah, something like that. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> it was when we were kids. But um, so Comcast makes this deal with Xbox. Well, at the, the, time. the predecessor to Xbox, the which predecessor, was right. Microsoft Media Center. Right. Um, which at the time, you know, was a, like a tower, right? Right, right. Um, and you know, my thought was at the time was okay. So that's interesting. So someone goes into Best Buy, they buy their tower, they go home, um, and there's some sort of easy way to set it up. And so suddenly now Comcast is out of the set-top box in the truck roll business. Wow, that's a huge amount of capex um, that that they get to take off their books. So they're not giving distributing the set-top boxes anymore. Now they're just distributing the content to other that's people's right. boxes, right? That's right. So it's a different so, model. Well, so I mean. I, yeah. And I think there's an argument today with things like connected TVs that the, the likes of Comcast, um, you know, could just become a dumb pipe. I don't think that's what's going to happen simply because I think everyone's going to jockey for some sense of ownership of the actual end user. Right. So, and, the, so the, what you know, the eyeballs are consuming, everybody wants a piece of that action. Right. You know, it's one of the things with connected TVs, and, and I... I know this has happened with a couple of smaller operators in Europe, but one of the things that over the last two or three years that I had assumed would happen was that 
a smaller operator would um, get out, you know, basically take the set top box and replace it with a, with a connected TV. And then, you know, basically develop a UX to sit on top of that connected TV so that it was still their interface and their branding on that interface. But they didn't have um, to fund the box and get the box into your home. They just right. created a service layer that you would leverage on your connected TV. Right. So that's, that's the European model right now? And you think. No, I'm not saying that's a European model. I'm saying that there are a couple of smaller operators that have been going down that path. Right, right. I, I don't. I don't think that has evolved to even remotely call it a quote unquote model. <laughs> but you've just seen, you saw it as a, because one of the things that we saw last year um, at CES, um, at least on LG, was that they, they created this tile interface, right, where you would find all your over the top services as, as apps almost to choose on the, on the set top box, on the screen. Yeah, what they called um, WebOS. WebOS, it was HP's thing. and Yeah. And so they rose up YouTube and Vudu and Vimeo and all those services that all the kids are using <laughs> and, and right. older now up to the top layer. And so that seemed to be what you're talking about, right? That's, that's where the connected TV really becomes your door into a variety of OTT services. You know? Yeah, and I think that's accurate. Um, and, and I think that's, but, but I still think that that you've got to have a mix that includes um, offerings from, from from linear programmers, right? Because that is still where the best content is, right? Because they're they have been doing it for years. They know how to do it, you know. Which is why the I think when Netflix did come out with House of Cards and Orange Isn't the Only Black, and now you have Amazon doing it as well. When the shows hit, everyone was in shock that, oh my God, a whole new bunch of players are making premium, you know, talked about water cooler content. So it's yeah. not so much that Amazon and Netflix and Hulu are pumping out shows or, or replaying old shows, but now they're creating that amazing content that lights the world on fire, which takes years to get to, right? And they did it. Well, and even even with the likes of YouTube, I mean, you're, you're, you're starting to see a lot of um, stuff rise, right? Well, you're see, you're seeing a lot of sort of up and coming content companies that are plucking um, some of these online stars off of YouTube. And I mean, I think that with a lot of OTT services that are smaller niche players, those are sort of good, good, good places for incubation. But I but I think that over time, as that content starts to gain traction, it will move. It's going to move to the bigger platforms. Right, right. And I always think about um, our friend Harley at Epic Mealtime, who had a very popular YouTube show. And then when um, the bio channel, biography channel was, um, the bio channel, <laughs> we're showing people's biology here. The biography channel changed to FY, I think it was FYC or FYI, or I might be mixing up the brands. But when they were launching their new cable channel, they brought Harley on because they, they and now they call it like, epic meal time but something else like his show but it's his show it's a youtube show because he has the millennial male audience and they wanted yeah. that so now instead of like you know youtube having its own audience that now they're grabbing youtube audiences from those influencers so you don't have to just go to youtube and buy an ad there now you can go to your cable network and buy a sponsorship there and get that youtube audience which is what they're yeah. all hoping um to bring the eyeballs ultimately right yeah, no, I, I, I agree with that. So, okay, so if we have a world now where all these OTT players are, are accessed through your connected TV environment, do each of those OTT players have to have their own ad models, or do you think where this will end up is that that connected TV environment, which is what you're kind of doing, will have ads that you then share revenue with all these other OTTs? Is that, is that kind of a model there? Well, I think that there are a number of models in play, um, and again, speaking speaking for myself, um, I mean, it, it, it's going to depend on the player. I mean, I've always one of the things that I've always thought was was really behind the promise of connected TV was the idea that it it basically allowed you to. I mean, let let's say that um, let's say you're a fan of one of the scripts networks. Um, and so you, you like cooking shows and so you watch 
you watch linear cooking shows like Top Chef or something, but you want to take a deeper dive into that category. Well, prior to connected TV is to take that deeper dive. Chances are you probably had to get online and, and get on your, you know, right, right. years ago, your laptop or, or your tablet. But now if you've got sort of a second layer of, of I mean, I, I hesitate to call them mid-tier because when you start talking about things, to me at least, when you start talking about things like niche content, it's not, to a lot of people, it's not mid-tier. It is premium content. Right, Because right. to a lot of people, that particular category represents a passion point. Right, and, and then so, they, they go down the funnel and that's what you want anyway. That's exactly right. And yeah. so in, in my world, um, in, in terms of talking to brands and what they're looking for, I mean, it sort of f it flips the scale model on its head, right? Because now the audience may be much smaller, but that audience is so much more engaged because they care so much right. about that content genre that, you know, the quality of those eyeballs, there's a lot of value in that. I think there is tremendous value in that, and that's why I don't ever understand when brands and advertisers don't want to jump on to these niche content op offerings because it's their audience. You don't have to go Super Bowl all the time, right? Well, and, and then I think if you fold in the concept of interactivity and the idea that, I mean, one of the things, even back when we were executing some of the first interactive TV campaigns with Dish, you know, to, one of the things we tried to impress upon people was the idea that, look, there's a return path here. And there's actually a mechanism by which um, the, the, your, the audience that is a, and let's, let's sync that up with this niche content idea, right? Now you've got a highly engaged audience and you've given them a tool to respond. And you can use interactivity on a connected TV to establish a dialogue with that audience. And, and an ongoing dialogue, as long as you're delivering them on a very regular basis, um, compelling content that keeps them coming back. So now you've got a sticky, engaged, um, responding audience. I mean, I, I was on a, I was talking to somebody last year, and you know, the the concept of DR came up, and I mean, DR in advertising has always been sort of this dirty, messy, stinky word. Um, <laughs> And, you know, and my response was, you know, I got to tell you, I, I think that interactivity on TV and, and, the, and on connected TV specifically, you know, you're going to see the rise of DR, but from a brand perspective, because, you know, now if there's a response mechanism, I mean, even if you're a, if you're a high profile brand, getting someone to engage and respond, there's value in that. Yeah. So you're seeing, you're seeing this is this one, two punch of get them down the funnel and then actually lead them to walleting, um, right. which which a lot of the connected TVs are are going to let you do soon, right? I mean, right. Well, and and then and then take that and the idea of synchronization between the TV and either a tablet or a phone, and now you've taken that audience and that audience is on the move. And now they can go to a store with a coupon or. And then, Precisely. and then, and then we're seeing the merging of physical and digital, which everybody's talking about yep. right now. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's yeah, I mean, even today with us, right? I mean, we've got, you know, 13, 14 million connected TVs in the United States. Um, it, it's not a, from a scale perspective, it's not huge, but if you can then get them syncing with their devices or target them in specific ways or get them involved in a dialogue on that screen. I mean, now it's much, it's not as so much about the size of, of that screen footprint, but what's going on within that screen footprint. Right, right, right. Right. I love, I love all of this because it's, it's sort of the combination of all the different technologies and behaviors kind of marching together. And then are you seeing the networks, because um, I know you're meeting with a lot of the studios and networks right, right now, do they get it? Because so much of our time together when we were working together and also my time now, all the time is education. Are the networks coming to you understanding this or are you still spending a lot of time teaching them about what's really going on out, out there? You know, I don't spend as much time engaged um, with the networks that those relationships are really managed uh, by a different part of the company. Um, but in general, are you doing a lot more education or, or has it evened out? I'm, I'll be honest, I'm slightly surprised 
surprised at how much education we're still doing. Got it. Um, so where is where although, are all the people that although, have learned stuff? Although I'll say this, I, <laughs> I saw I saw a report yesterday where it was one of those usual, you know, asking a bunch of people across the agency universe, what are your priorities for 2015 in terms of where you're going to recommend your clients spend their time. Um, and connected TV was third on the list. Mm. And so, so I was, I was really encouraged by that. I think that people, and I mean, it's, it's not, it's not surprising to me simply because over the last two or three years, incrementally, I have seen, you know, three years ago, people just were, we're not, you know, nobody's using their connected TV. We don't think there's an audience there, blah, blah, blah. And I mean, like any medium, right? It's, Everything in the early days with connected TV, you were seeing people that were buying connected TVs that didn't even understand why they bought a connected TV or why they should hook it up. And you know now we're seeing connection rates that are pushing eighty percent on that, connected TVs. Yeah, that's amazing. And so and so and part of that has to do with the content mix, right? Right. I mean, you know, now that the likes of Netflix and Amazon Prime are bringing quality content to the OTT experience. Everyone's understanding that whole, there's there's a completely new world of content for me to access on this connected TV. I need to get that thing plugged in and hooked up and start using it. And of course, now that now that audience is there, now the content that is there, now that usage is there, I think the advertising community is going, okay, I need to pay attention to this now. Right. Very well said. Um, and a nice lead in to my next question to you for our next segment. <laughs> I'm just here to help. <laughs> well, when you get really passionate, you lean forward and. So then we see your whole figure in the screen, which is pretty cool too. You've, you've I should stay leaned back. <laughs> <laughs> Our next segment is the is the what cool technology trend do you see coming up next that's getting you excited? Let's see what sound effect. <gasps> yes. Ooh, nice. Especially for a Friday morning, easing in. So what 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 trends are turning you on now? Not just from your your role and your you know connected TV perspective, but what what is exciting you about technology today out there from a cons consumer perspective? Um, is it proximity? Is it all these cool tablets? You know, over the top, um, out of home. Like what what's what are you most excited about? Um, I, I'm somewhat limited in terms of what. I can say about this, um, but I can tell you, I can tell you the thing that's got, and I'm sort of surprised at myself um, on this one, virtual reality okay. has got me really excited. Um, and, and when it first came up internally, I was like, eh, yeah, whatever. And having now used some of the goggles, it's, mm -hmm. I mean, I've even said, I think people in general, sort of when they first think about virtual reality, because I know I did. Um, when it, when I first started thinking about it, I thought, you know, the, the, the audience for this is going to be, you know, either gamers. It's just going to be so niche yeah. that I just don't see widespread adoption for this. And, you know, now that I've been using some of the goggles that we have internally and playing with it, I'm like, I, not that I'm a focus group of one, right? But I'm like, I would totally buy this. I would absolutely totally buy a pair of these. This is freaking unbelievable. And is it um, is it unbelievable because you're having these immersive gaming experiences? Are you like you in particular? Are, I I put this in your bio, but you're a foodie and a wine enthusiast, and you really care about that you know that kind of experience. Are you you know exploring restaurants when you do this, or is it more of like riding a roller coaster? Or where do you it's, really see? I mean, I've seen Cirque du Soleil footage. I've seen concert footage. I mean, they're literally. I mean, I, I. Someone was telling me the other day that somebody put six GoPros on a drone and flew it through Burning Man. I mean, it oh, just. Oh wow! Yeah. There's yeah. there's all this. It's to me. To, I, I'm not a gamer. To me, the gaming piece is probably the least compelling aspect of it. It's. The idea that you could be at a sporting event or a concert and you literally, you feel like you're there, you're sitting in the audience. I mean, I saw a piece of Cirque du Soleil content, which it was actually a practice that was being filmed. And you turned around with the goggles and there was like a janitor behind you who was cleaning <laughs> up because it wasn't a live performance. I mean, right. you literally, you're there. Right. Um, right. It's going to open the door up to a whole new kind of type of entertainment that's been being sold I think too and also a new kind of what is community because if we're all in that same chair together that's right right and, like we can and, all be in and, that same seat yeah and I think that so 
I'm, I'm surprised at my own reaction to it in terms of I literally, when this hits the market, I'm buying one. I, I, this is really cool. And so I think that a lot of people are underestimating the breadth of the, the user base for these devices. And, and, and I also think that I think there's some amount of skepticism right now about the idea that brands would get involved. But I think there are two, there are two layers to that. I think you've got a lot of brands, I mean, you know, brands like Pepsi, et cetera, that, you know, they sponsor concert series. They do a lot of really, really cool stuff in sort of the branded entertainment space that fits really, really well in a VR world. And then I think you've got another layer of, you know, and this kind of gets back to what we were saying about uh, niche content, right? If you're like, if you could take a, if, if you're a travel enthusiast and you can take a virtual tour of a, of a property or a cruise ship before you not go, that I'm into cruise ships. Yeah. Um, or, or anything like that. Or if you're a, into if you cruise take a virtual ships. tour of a winery, <laughs> if that's what you're into, I mean, it's just, it's kind of limitless in terms of the idea that you can bring the experience to people. Um, and that would help them go, oh, wow, okay, I must do that in real life. Do you, now, do you think that, um, I'm, this is just me asking you personally, but because, like, one thing I'm always doing is trying to figure out, okay, where should we go on a family vacation? Like, what yeah. will what will turn on my husband who has specific needs, me, and then having a five-year-old? So, uh, And I'd love to see the places because I know what my husband will like. And I can't tell you how many times I've been out with him where we show up at this place we plan for six months and I see his face drop because it's not what we thought it was going to be and I, then I think to myself oh my god I'm in for it for the next five days you know what I mean like we made a mistake so do you well, think it, it, um, it'll be like that or will people stop going to places because they can just hook up oh I don't I don't think people will stop going that sort of I think di- particularly di- when it comes to that kind of thing it's it's one thing to get a sense of what it is to be in that location and to, you know, I don't sit by that pool, be at that beach. It's a completely different thing to actually sit by the pool. Right. And so be there'll at that be beach. different, there'll be different versions, different reasons you're using it. Sometimes it really will be so you can watch that Colts game in the stadium, even if you're in Berlin. Um, right. Because there are a lot of NFL fans across the world now. And I happen to know the head of uh, digital for the Colts and. A lot of what he's doing right now is creating social engagement experiences for a global cult audience. And I'm just picking right. that team in particular. But so you can start to say, now I can buy a ticket in the stadium and watch that game versus now I'm um, checking out a cruise ship before I go versus now I'm taking this class with this famous professor, you know, and I actually feel like I'm in the room being lectured to because we see all this online learning stuff happening too. Yeah. So so I think there's you like tremendous opportunities in this space. So do you think the VR space then will, will be owned by the consumer electronics businesses or this might get into your not allowed to talk about but or will it be studios and networks um, or it will be surprise third parties that get bought by Facebook, you know. Um, or, I, you know it's open field really, right? Yeah, you know, that kind of gets back to the old what is king content or distribution? Right, right, right. Very good. Uh, I, I just, my answer for, gosh, I don't know, 70 years has been. You're, uh, but you're actually not 70 years old. <laughs> I know that you you think you are, but you're not. Because <laughs> I, I think I've given celebrated. Given the line of work I've been in, I feel that way. I feel, um, I feel like I've celebrated some of your birthdays, and I do not remember <laughs> over 60 candles yet. You know, oh, or even even in the fifties, a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, um, fire hazard. I mean, but my answer to that has always been neither. I mean, right. good content needs distribution, right? And distribution platforms need good content. So when you ask me in in, in terms of virtual reality as a content medium, whether or not I think the CE manufacturers are going to own it or the content providers are going to own it, uh, they both are. Right. Right. Someone's got to make the devices, and someone's got to build the content to go on the devices. I because can, uh, yeah, if, the, if that marriage that. doesn't happen, then neither side of that equation is successful. I can totally see a world where, you know, you have your VR hookup at home, you have your gaming box, and you have, like, cartridges or codes or whatever. And so you go, hey, honey, tonight do you want to do some VR? And you put on your goggles and you have an experience or something like that. So it's a choice of entertainment, you know, or can if we, you're training or something like that. You know, like, now I can do Krag Maga at home. Why, why are you looking like that? 
<laughs> I'm just trying to get past the, hey, honey, would you like to do some VR tonight? Like, <laughs> just... <laughs> jo- Jody knows my husband. Sorry, too, so. <laughs> sorry, but my eyes are burning a little bit. I'm just... <laughs> you don't think you and your lovely wife Paige would ever say? Um, could, could, it, could... Next topic. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, another uh, another area that we like to talk about here on the Tech Cat Show is, you know, where do you, Jody McAfee, a uh, bon vivant, a uh, man about town in the. Uh, technology connected TV space, where do you find out the latest outside of your day-to-day work? Like, what do you, um, where do you go to? So this is the, where do you get your information? <laughs> wow. That was very loud. <laughs> um, sorry, can you still hear, Jody? That was like 1970s Cleveland newsroom <laughs> intro. <laughs> We're here, Cleveland's top news story tonight. <laughs> What are <laughs> no what newsletters? Cleveland. What newsletters do you read, Jody McAvoy? Um, <laughs> God, I, I, you know, it's funny you asked me that because just the other day I was looking at my. I try to parse out sort of the things that I get in my work email versus the things that I get in my personal email, and I've now got I've now, I'm now subscribing to so many things, about fifty percent, maybe even sixty percent of which are just redundant because they're curating for you, but it's the same articles they're pulling from. Yeah. Well, um what do you find the most valuable? <laughs> like are there a few that to you are um, you know, must read? So I'll be I'll be honest, the thing that I use the most now um in terms of action like a feed for information, um is Twitter. Oh, it's Twitter. Okay, so Twitter's a big source of a curation for you. Well, because I did, it basically allowed me to do my own curation. Right, right. I, I like that. I follow either, either people that I I know and respect, and whose opinions um, over the years I've grown to trust, or I follow sources like, say, TechCrunch, um, or or the Recode guys. Um, and then the one the one email newsletter that I get um, daily that it's I love it but I hate it at the same time um, I love it because it curates a really really interesting mix of articles from across uh, our space I hate it because the list of the the articles in it on a daily basis there tend to be so many of them I can't keep up with the damn thing and that is uh, Jason Hershorn's uh, media redef. Yeah, and everybody who's come on the show has mentioned him. And in fact, um, I think there's an article um, in the Media Post today about what is he building. He's almost building a information bundle for the future um, because his curation is so strong, and he has multiple tiers within that curation. Now, I don't know if you've noticed it if you go to the site, but he's broken it out into business categories. Um, Yes. Yeah, so well, so his, his and, and I well, he's broken it. Out. He's got. A, he's now got a sports newsletter. He's got a fashion newsletter. Right. Right. Um, and I mean this, and it's funny because I was following some of the things that he was saying and doing for several years, and then he came out with the newsletter, and he does a really good job of curation. And this get, kind of gets back to what we were talking about earlier in terms of content consumption, even on connected TVs. I mean, even even when I was at Mini Web Technologies, we were talking, we were figuring out ways on a connected device to have sort of buddies and that you had sort of a trusted group of people that they were sharing what they were watching and, and it was they were helping you sort of build your own almost personal MVPD, right? Right, right, right. And, and I think that applies in a lot of spaces because I think right now what people are really struggling with, and, and I use myself as the example, and what I was saying earlier about I really need to call the number of email newsletters yeah. I get on a daily basis is yeah. Yeah. it's information overload. Right. And so how do we if find I can, the right stuff? If I can find trusted sources, um, you know, I don't follow you on Twitter because I really don't trust you. But um, <laughs> no, he he not only does he follow me on Twitter, but he'll call me and say, you're in New York. You didn't tell me you're in New York. And I'll be like, how do you know I'm in New York? And he goes, I follow you on Twitter. <laughs> I was like, OK. <laughs> and then there's like this Shazam like, hey, Twitter works. Awesome. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always like, how did you know I had back pain? Because you posted on Facebook. And I'm yeah. like, oh, okay, so you're not stalking me. You're just reading my posts. That's great. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but but I, think, I think that in that world of information overload, if you can, you know, it goes back to how I use Twitter. I've got a short list of trusted people and sources that I use. I follow them. 
And then it's sort of depending on what pops up and I see and I go, oh, that's interesting. And then I'll go to that place and then it'll sort of broaden what I'm figuring out. Um, you know, I, I use Jason Hirshhorn um, and his newsletter to read stuff. What else do I use? That's kind of it because, I mean, I could go down the list of feeds that I follow on Twitter, but it's it's going to be your standard. Um, the, the like Wired and um, TechCrunch and what what else do you what is, is it TechCrunch, GigaOM, um, Recode. I mean, a lot, but even with some of those guys, right? I mean, it's just you get links to the same. It's not the same article, but it's the same topic. Right, right, right. And oftentimes, <clears throat> I mean, some people will have interesting spins on the same topic, but by and large, you know, it's the same piece of information. Do you um, do you go to developer conferences now because you're working on a platform that you're, you know, building building content models for and ad models for? Are you it's, are you are you geeking out a bit in that direction? It's Funny you should say that. The reason I'm in San Francisco is because we just held our developer conference. Really? Um, I didn't know yeah, that. I, no, I'm just I, kidding. No, it's shocking. <laughs> shocking. I, fi- I actually figured it out the other day when we talked, and I asked you to do this, and I thought, oh, he's there probably for the Samsung developer conference. By the yeah, way, it's, turn, it's, turn Actually, to your, it's funny. My brother-in-law turn. was here for a medical device conference and walked by the Moscone Center and went and saw the signs for the Samsung thing and was like, texted me. He goes, hey, are you here? I'm like, yeah, I'm here. Now, Jody, um, turn, turn to your right for one second. Turn to your all the way to your right, all the way. <laughs> I'm just playing with the windows. Okay, was there sorry. Some, was there someone behind me? No, there's. <laughs> I've never really done this before, but I just noticed that the way the windows are. All right. Anyway, so you so you went to the developers conference, and are you are um, do you think that the d- developer conferences seem to be like the new cool thing to do? Like every platform seems to be having having them now because it seems like that's the way again to build your community. Because really, the best ideas are going to come from people out there, the entrepreneurs, the folks that are using the platform. So when you go to developers conference, you have all these cool geeks that are building for your platform. So did you find, did you see a lot of new innovative ideas that you never would have thought of yourself? Um, I did not, because I was in meetings all day. <laughs> <every day. laughs> I well, was so it so you were to admit you were this. meeting with some um, ad, ad agency people though? You were meeting with a mutual friend of ours. Was he there attending? I the- was so I was introducing um, some of our um, clients to a lot of our service groups, okay. Um, okay. which was very interesting and helpful because it's always sort of good in the in the early stages of, of development to get feedback from your actual customers. Um, and were your customers were were the folks from the agency in town to attend the conference, or were they just there coincidentally? A combination of both. Oh, cool. Um, Because you were meeting with some of our holding company buddies um, in the ad agencies, um, which I thought was interesting, connected to the the conference itself. Um, And I just know a lot of my friends are always emailing me and saying, oh, I've got to go to this developer conference or I've got to go to that. And in the past, if you said developer conference, everyone's eyes would glaze over and they wouldn't want to be there. But now everyone wants to be at the Twitter developer conference at the Facebook developer conference and at the different the Samsung the Apple whatever it is like those are now the hottest tickets in the world well I mean 10 years ago brands weren't going to CES right 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 true 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 and Jody and I actually hang out a lot at CES um, and try and have a good meal if <laughs> we're usually both too busy um, so a- anything else that we can um, we should be looking out for in your world? I know you, you you know you can't talk about what you guys are are doing, but anything you think coming out that's interesting that we should pay attention to, keep our eyes open for the the, the VR stuff and anything else really. Cool? I, I think I think I would definitely keep my eye out for the for the VR stuff. The VR stuff um, is really a mind yeah. blow. Yeah, yeah. I, and and do you, and you think that it will 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 there be a ubiquitous pair of goggles that you will use for any VR content or do you think it will be proprietary and to the platform so that I'll have to have like four different pairs of goggles in my living room I think you're uh, that's a great question um, I think in the early days like with any new platform like this you're going to see some fragmentation but I think over t- I think over time it, it will become ubiquitous so it'll be it'll be one pair, um, sort of like how three three D it kind of happened or is starting to kind of become a singular 
pair of glasses, but now still, depending on the studio and the network, they all have their own proprietary, you know, thing. Right. Um, um, well, that's great. Well, I want to thank you so much for um, coming on the Tech Cat Show and, um, you know, what, joining what us. Is that? What does that mean? Technology Catalyst, baby. Oh. <laughs> Remember? I thought it was like some hipster term. Um, it is hipster as well. <laughs> so do you like roll your jeans up and wear wingtips with no socks? Um, I wear whatever's clean. <laughs> I've, I've actually I've actually banned that look from our office in Soho. Oh, you have? Oh, that's yeah. right, because your office is in Soho. So when you uh, walk well, into... Well, and I live in Brooklyn, right? So I get to spend a lot of time on subway platforms. And with, with hipsters, with that's right. Right. So have, uh, they, have they said to you, you're not cool enough to hang out with us? Well, they can't really say that out loud because they work for me. Okay. <laughs> So you're employing a lot of, but, of they, but they've implied it more than once. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you're working. So you're managing a lot of millennials right now. I would think. They're just kids. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now you're definitely being safe. <laughs> call them. Call them what you want. <laughs> All right. Wait. One thing. What is your favorite restaurant in New York City right now, Mr. Foodie? Oh, right Mr. now. Foodie. This is such an easy question. Um, Bobby Flay's new restaurant um, on Lafayette called Gato, G-A-T-O. G-A-T-O, okay. Is fantastic. And what's the what's the theme around it? Like, is it? Uh, it's Mediterranean, but it's the whole, so it's basically, it's something, so it's the Mediterranean, but it goes around the Mediterranean to each of the countries that touch the Mediterranean. Um, and one of the reasons we love it is because my wife is vegetarian, um, and there's a really awesome selection of stuff for a vegetarian. Right, right, because the Mediterranean is all is all about that. What about in San Francisco? Do you have a favorite restaurant there? My favorite restaurant in San Francisco. Um, well, it's going to depend on the cuisine. But if you if I was asked to pick two that I I pretty much try to go to every time I'm here, and oddly enough I didn't go this trip, it would be either Frascati or Boulevard. Um, Boulevard's been there forever, but it's still awesome. Yeah, I mean, Jody is seriously the, the biggest foodie I know. I mean, not in size. I mean, <laughs> no, honestly, that's probably accurate as well. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you again, Mr. McAfee. Thanks for joining the Tech Cat Show. Tech trends impacting your business. We'll see you all in two weeks. Come visit us, listen to the show, and join us. Thank you. Welcome to the new sound of online radio. Welcome to the sound of Universal Broadcasting Network. Cause you make me feel alive. I've been locked out of hell. A mix of today's hits and hard to find favorites. Combined with the most entertaining and intriguing talk anywhere. This is your sound. This is the sound of Universal Broadcasting Network. At UBN Radio.